Um, I will be doing a sermon for you if you still have a little space for me. I know you were probably have 20 people in a row, but at the end of the month, I did send you a, um, a WhatsApp. I want to do. I I don't always see my WhatsApp. The, uh, your um, message on Facebook message. Oh, okay. Just check. Okay. <sighs> Oh, yes, and some of it will come out of here as well. That book that um, that Pastor um, Ted Schultz spoke about. Uh, I don't know if you have this book. Okay, so the issues around personal ministries, the issues around in the certain private or independent ministries, and why the church took the view on tithes and offerings. And before we start, I mean, it is live on YouTube now, but. Um... I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were discussing some people that really, I don't know, I just keep getting it every now and then from people that think things should change and that there's too much of daddy on our program. And I'm here to say yeah. it's going to stay the way it is. Amen. Because yeah. people are finding him that never heard this before. And it's not to yeah. build him up. It's just the way he does it is good. And this is his ministry. It's not mine. It's my dad's and mom's and it's still yeah. going. So if anybody hears anything, I just get kind of annoyed. They, they just go on and on because they, they want everything. And there's people that have asked me, if you're going to quit, can I have all your contacts? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not going to quit anyway. And no, I wouldn't do it even if I did, you know, and they, I know that they have some things that don't quite go. And I'm not saying we have everything right. And they're all wrong, but it's like, come on, we are who we are. Leave me alone. I'm doing the best I can. But anyway, just so you guys know, if you hear anything and I'm, you know, I've had people tell me that and they say, why do you always go about the feast? And, you know, and I'm like, that's because that's what this is. Yes. I have my dad's yes. evangelism series that he added. He went back and went to all the trouble to redo those 28 yeah. series so that he could add in feast and statutes and stuff where Adventists keep them out because they don't know how to do it. And then also his nine series plus everybody else in between. But I'm trying to get more of our stuff here edited so I can put it on there so I can play more of our recent stuff on our 24 hour program. But it's going to take some time to lighten. All Maybe you can do is, head, I can sit down and just do it. All you can do is tell those people, find another channel you like. This yep. is what I mean to that. I yes. mean to that. Okay. There's a very short and sweet answer, like Dave says. Okay. If you don't like it, go choose one of the 10,000 other channels in there. Okay. <laughs> the Lord will lead you to the right one. Okay. You That's are not true. here. Yeah. You are not under force to be here. Okay. <laughs> and sorry, I get very excited and very upset because people tend to think that they have a right to something that's not theirs. It happened to my ministry as well. Sandy knows what I'm talking about, that people think they can dictate to you, okay? The Lord has given you a commission, Sandy, okay? You carry that commission. We support you 100%. That's we what were I'm going to say about that. At one time, we were called a cult, and there's no one here <laughs> that's got a gun held to their head and forced to watch Exactly, this. exactly. You know, Sandy, you've got over a thousand people on Facebook, okay? I think I can think there are a lot of people circling for your little address book. Don't give anybody anything. The feast it's yours, statutes, it's your ministry. You can't change that. Right. Oh, no, don't go there. Uh -uh. Okay, well, um, it's 10.02 on my computer, so I have it ready. Every It's all ready, so Ed and Linda can go right ahead. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to share the screen. Okay. I just want to welcome everybody. It's so great to see your faces. Good morning. Yeah, well... <laughs> Let's pray. Ooh, that's nice. Dear loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath day. Lord, we ask for your blessing as we look into this account of Jeroboam. Increase our understanding, Lord. I pray in the precious name of your only begotten Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the name of this little presentation that Ed and I did is called Jeroboam and the Man of God. 
And it's a portrait, in our opinion, of Antichrist and the fallen remnant movement. Paul tells us that the history of the nation of Israel is recorded so that we may learn from it. And he says, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the story of Jeroboam and the prophet who rebuked him has something important to say to God's remnant people in these last days. And this story is found in 1 Kings. And besides just being very interesting, um, we who live in the last days do really have something to learn from it. So this um, little presentation is how we interpret this and people may not agree. They may not see it exactly the same way, but um, we're just presenting it to give you something to think about. So I'll, I'll ask for help reading these slides, please. And um, please also jump in with comments if you have them. Does somebody want to start here, please? And Solomon, <clears throat> excuse me. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Okay, continue. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Because of idolatry, the result of multiplying heathen wives, Solomon Lee learns that the kingdom would be rent out of his, cut out of his, or torn away from him in the person of his heirs, his sons. Yeah, so the, the setting of his story is the end of Solomon's reign, and you all remember that and the division of Israel uh, into two kingdoms. Um, the Northern 10 tribes became the kingdom of Israel under Jeroboam. And the Southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin became um, the kingdom of Judah under Rehoboam, which was Solomon's um, son. And the Southern kingdom was centered at Jerusalem. And of course, all the worship of the temple was in Jerusalem in the Southern kingdom still. May I continue, please? And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, the Solom uh, Shilamite, found him in the way. And he clad himself with a new garment. And they too were alone in the field. And, Eli and Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rented him 12 pieces. Continue. And he said to Jeroboam, take thee 10 pieces. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of, the, of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. Okay, continue please. And I will take thee and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth and shall be king over Israel. And it shall be if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee and will walk in my ways and do th that is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, 
that I will be with thee and build thee a sure house as I built for David and I and will give Israel unto thee. So Jeroboam was promised success if he would obey God's law. That was the condition. And in the course of time, through the vanity and arrogance of Solomon's son and heir, Rehoboam, this prophecy was fulfilled. Jeroboam became the ruler of the 10 northern tribes of Israel, while Rehoboam in Jerusalem remained king over Judah and Benjamin. While Jeroboam is first described as a mighty man of valor, um, Rehoboam is described by the spirit of prophecy as headstrong, confident, self-willed, and inclined to idolatry, so not very complimentary. Um, but Jeroboam, um, in the course of time, did not live up to his high calling, as we'll see. He had every advantage to start with, but he did not succeed. Does someone want to read this, please? It's supposed to be my turn, but I can't see all of it because part okay. of it is blotted I'll, out. I'll read Marty. Okay. Uh, placed on the throne by the ten tribes of Israel who had rebelled against the house of David, Jeroboam, the former servant of Solomon, was in a position to bring about wise reforms in both civil and religious affairs. Mm -hmm. Under the rulership of Solomon, he had shown aptitude and sound judgment, and the knowledge he had gained during the years of faithful service fitted him to rule with discretion. But Jeroboam failed to make God his trust. Continue, please. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam the king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam king of judah and this um, photograph that i had found just happens to be the archaeological site um, identified with with shechem ancient shechem continue please whereupon whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. Yeah, so we can see how Satan begins to take advantage of us when we deviate from the course that God has set. And we make our own way instead. Continue, please. Jeroboam's greatest fear was that at some future time, the hearts of his subjects might be won over by the ruler occupying the throne of David. He reasoned that if the 10 tribes should be permitted to visit often the ancient state of the Jewish monarchy, where the services of the temple were still conducted as it in the years of Solomon's reign, many might feel inclined to renew their allegiance to the government centering at Jerusalem. Taking counsel with his advisors, Jeroboam determined that by one bold stroke to lessen, so far as possible, the probability of a revolt from his rule. He would bring this about by creating within the borders of his newly formed kingdom two centers of worship, one at Bethel and the other at Dan. In these places, the ten tribes should be invited to assemble instead of at Jerusalem to worship God. Continue, please. In arranging the transfer, Jeroboam thought to appeal to the imagination of the Israelites by setting before them some visible representation to symbolize the presence of the invisible God. Accordingly, he caused to be made two calves of gold, and these were placed within 
shrines at the appointed centers of worship in this if effort to represent the deity, Jeroboam violated the plain command of Jehovah. Thus, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not have bow down thyself to them, not serve them. I continue. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not the, of the sons of Levi. The king tried to persuade the Levites, some of whom were living within his realm, to serve as priests in the newly erected shrines at Bethel and Dan. But in this effort, he met with failure. He was <laughs> therefore compelled to elevate to the priesthood men from the lowest of the people. Alarmed over the prospect, many of the faithful, including a great number of the Levites, fled to Jerusalem, where they might worship in harmony with the divine requirements. And continue. And Jeroboam, and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month and on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So Jeroboam declares a counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles, um, which begins on the 15th day of the seventh month. And um, you can see how easy it sometimes becomes to justify ourselves when we deviate from God's clear commands. Uh, for wh whatever reason we do this, whether it's for our own convenience, our own supposed safety or well-being, we can make hundreds of excuses why we cannot obey God's law, just like Jeroboam did. None of them are acceptable. <laughs> Amen, Marty. None of them are acceptable. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar and the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he shall... And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Continue. The king, Fine, go ahead. Okay, the king's bold defiance of God in thus setting aside divinely appointed institutions was not allowed to pass unrebuked. Even while he was officiating and burning incense during the dedication of a strange altar he had set up in Be at Bethel, there appeared before him a man of God from whom, uh, from the kingdom of Judah, sent to denounce him for pressuring, uh, or sorry, presuming to introduce new forms of worship. The prophet cried ag against the altar. Oh. Continue. Marty. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Continue, please. You know, it's interesting to know that the eighth month, our time here in the United States is late November, early December. 
Now, there's another feast that somebody changed. Yeah, we're going to get to that part, Abel, for sure. You're absolutely right about that. <laughs> on, on seeing this, Jeroboam was filled with a spirit of defiance against God and attempted to restrain the one who had delivered the message. In wrath, he put forth his hand from the altar and cried out, lay hold on him. His impetuous act met with switch rebuke. The hand outstretched against the messenger of Jehovah suddenly became powerless and withered and could not be withdrawn. And continue, please. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. So isn't it amazing how his attitude changed, like at a snap of the fingers, <laughs> but that was only temporary. Vain had been Jeroboam's effort to invest with solemnity the dedication of the strange altar, respect for which would have led to disrespect for the worship of Jehovah in the temple at Jerusalem. By the message of the prophet, the king of Israel should have been led to repent and to renounce his wicked purposes, which were turning the people away from the true worship of God. But he hardened his heart and determined to follow a way of his own choosing. And continue, please, somebody read. At the time of the Feast of Bethel, the hearts of the Israelites were not fully hardened. Many were susceptible to the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord designed that those who were taking rapid steps in apostasy should be checked in their course before it should be too late. He sent his messengers to interpret the idolatrous proceedings and to reveal to king, to king and people what the outworking of this apostasy would be. The rending of the altar was a sign of God's displeasure at the admonition that was being wrought in Israel. Continue. And the king said unto the man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in that, this place. For so it was charged to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. So, so far, the man of God that was sent from Judah is doing well because God told him, don't eat anything, don't drink anything, don't come back the same way, just go do and deliver the message I gave you and come right back a different way. And, and he did, so far. Continue, please. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also to their father, and their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. Continue. And he went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that cometh from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee or go with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou comest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, 
bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So it sounded great, didn't it? But it was all a lie. It was all a lie. So Go we ahead. have we have to be sure of uh, when something like that happens, it's opposite of what we know God told us. We have to seek his face and be sure that uh, this false prophet that came to him is of God or not, because uh, we can be led astray by saying, well, God told me. Oh. That, that is so true. And think of the Garden of Eden. Eve mm -hmm. was led astray by the devil in the form of a serpent saying to her, yea, indeed, has God said. Yeah. So it's, it's the same thing, just happening all over again. That's the reason it's so important to be in tune with God and know his voice. Yes. Yes. Okay, continue, please. So he went back with him, and he did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place, of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. And continue, please. I'll read it again. Well, well, would it be for would have been for the prophet had he adhered to his purpose to return to Judah without delay. While traveling homeward by another route, he was overtaken by an aged man who claimed to be a prophet, and who made false representations to the man of God, declaring. I am a prophet, also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. Again and again the lie was repeated, and the invitation urged until the man of God was pers persuaded to return. Because the true prophet allowed himself to take a course contrary to the line of duty, God permitted him to suffer the penalty of his transgression. Sure. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a warning for us, that's, isn't it? <laughs> that is a warning. <laughs> and it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when that prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him unto the lion, which has torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. You know, the, the lion is symbolic for Christ. If you uh, are disobedient, you're going to have to answer to him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I didn't think of that. But that's true. Does someone want to read this, please? And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass, and they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alice, my brother. And it came to pass that after he had buried him, that he spoke to his sons, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. 
for the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. So it's hard to say whether this false prophet had a change of heart and repented or not. I don't know. I can't figure him out, but. Yeah, this has always been a very hard story for me. I, I There's so much questions. Yeah. Um, what motive? Well, we can figure what motivated him to begin with to deceive the true man of God. But then all of a sudden he makes this complete turnaround. Um, yeah, and it's it, kind of strange. It, right. And it also, I. You, you can read where the Lord speaks to the, the prophet that's speaking false. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a very strange, uh, to me, story. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me of Balaam a little bit. Um, the Lord spoke to him as well, even though he was um, covetous and was hired right. to speak against the children of Israel. So a lot of human beings in the Bible, isn't there, with all their fickle ways yes okay somebody want to read this please after this thing jeroboam returned not from his evil way but made again of the lowest of the people priest of the high places whosoever would he consecrated him and he became one of the priests of the high places and this thing became sin unto the house of jeroboam even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. So the penalty that overtook the unfaithful messenger was a still further evidence of the truth of the prophecy uttered over the altar. If after disobeying the word of the Lord, the prophet had been permitted to go on in safety, the king would have used this fact in an attempt to vindicate his own disobedience. In the rent altar, in the palsied arm, and in the terrible fate of the one who dared disobey an express command of Jehovah, Jeroboam should have discerned the swift displeasure of an offended God. And these judgments should have warned him not to persist in, wrong, in wrongdoing. But far from repenting, Jeroboam made again of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, whosoever would, he consecrated him. And he became one of the priests of the high places. Thus, he not only sinned greatly himself, but made Israel to sin. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. So um, what does this say to us today? This story, how does Jeroboam portray Antichrist? Um, the actions of Jeroboam are mirrored in the actions of the Antichrist power that is in the world today. And she tells us very clearly who the Antichrist power is in the world today in great controversy. <clears throat> Previous to the rise of the papacy, all opposition to the law of God had been in the form of paganism. God had been openly defied, but from that time, the opposition was carried on under the guise of professed allegiance to him. The papacy, however, was no less the instrument of Satan than was pagan Rome. For all the power, the seat, and the great authority of the papacy were given it by the dragon. And so, although the Pope professes to be the vicegerent of Christ, he is in reality the vicegerent of Satan, he is Antichrist. And that word is such a strange word to me, vicegerent. So I looked it up and it means um, one ruling in the place of a surrogate ruler, a surrogate ruler. I even went to um, YouTube to learn how to pronounce it. It's just a strange word, but that's what it means. One, one who's ruling in the place of. So the Pope professes to be ruling in the place of Christ on earth. Someone want to read this, please? Jeroboam observed the worship of the true God, Jehovah, and substituted his own. He defied di deity as the golden calves that he had fashioned. He said to them, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. 
Antichrist also redefines God as the most holy trinity and an entity not described in the Bible. The entire liturgy and infusion of human tradition is not biblical. Continue, please. Jeroboam Jeroboam flagrantly broke God's commandments and used these graven images to captivate the people into his form of worship. He set the one in Bethel and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. Antichrist also employs idols and graven images in his institutions of worship and teaches the people that are in that system to do so also. Uh, you know, they, they have Jupiter there as, uh, the, uh, as Peter <laughs> without a toe. It's been uh, kissed so many times, the toe worn off or something like that. I thought I read that somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we saw it in, when uh, we were in Italy. And the towel is so thin, there's actually a hole in it. Wow. Actually, wow. it's been repaired a couple of times. Well, really? this was in the 90s when we were there, and so it was well-worn. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd think of a staircase could be uh, moved from one uh, part of the world to another. That'd be a small thing to replace the toe. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you'd think. Miraculous. Unlike Dave, I've heard it has been. Okay, let's move on, guys. Somebody read this, please. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month. That mimics the true divine feast of unleavened bread in the seventh month. Antichrist has ordained many false holy days, including Easter, a day with origins in the worship of Ishtar, goddess of fertility. He has purposefully negated all the divinely appointed times of the Lord, including the seventh day Sabbath and replaced them with times of his own invention. Continue, please. Jeroboam elevated his own priesthood, men of the lowest sort. When the Levites would not cooperate with him, Jeroboam made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Antichrist is the head of a priestly system that is not biblical. Many are the perversions and scandals surrounding some of these priests as well. The Catholic hierarchy is not tested and proved by having the Son of God in its midst to reprove its hypocrisy and rebuke its corruptions as Jesus did those of the priests and Pharisees. Its emissaries show the same spirit against Christ's followers and treat them exactly as they would treat the Son of God were he in their place. Yeah, so we're seeing all these parallels now between Jeroboam's worship system and the worship system of Antichrist. It's striking to me how, um, how detailed these parallels are. Jeroboam made a strange altar and offered upon the altar and burnt incense. This idolatrous altar was not commanded by God. And a Christ also has an idolatrous altar. Um, through the false non-biblical doctrine of transubstantiation, Christ is considered to be literally offered on many thousands of Catholic altars throughout the world every single day. Mm -hmm. And this is a quote from Fox's Book of Martyrs. To fancy the words of consecration perform what the papists call transubstantiation by converting the wafer and wine into the real and identical body and blood of Christ, which was crucified and which afterward ascended into heaven is too gross an absurdity for even a child to believe who was to come to the least glimmering of reason and that nothing but the most blind superstition could make the Roman Catholics put a confidence in anything 
so completely ridiculous. So that's them saying it. Amen. Somebody continue, please. Rome persecuted God's true messenger who brought him the truth. In the process of doing so, he received a wound which was healed. He heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar of in Bethel, that he had put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. He continued to rebel against God after this. Antichrist also persecuted God's true people for 1,260 years and received a deadly wound, which was healed. He will continue to rebel against God even in these last days. Can you continue, please? Jeroboam, because of his sin, was finally destroyed by God. Toward the close of a troubled reign of 22 years, Jeroboam met with a disastrous defeat in a war with Abijah, the successor of Rehoboam. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him and he died. Antichrist and his system will ultimately be destroyed in the lake of fire, Revelation 19.20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Okay, so how does the man of God, this was the true prophet from um, Judah, how does he portray the fallen remnant? The man of God started out well in complete obedience to God in every particular. He delivered present truth to Jeroboam. He possessed the spirit of prophecy. The original remnant movement also delivered present truth to the world concerning true and false worship and the nature of the man of sin and the events of the last days. They possess the spirit of prophecy. The man of God was seduced by a false prophet into disobedience and compromise. This cost him his life. The remnant movement was eventually seduced away from their original commission by conformity with the false prophets of evangelicalism and ecumenism including all their false doctrines. This cost them, in our opinion, again, their spiritual life. I'm speaking very generally here, not of individuals. They exchanged the true God of, for the false golden calves of Trinitarianism and the rejection of the statutes and judgments and of the Torah. Uh, Linda? Yes. I have a question from Ethlyn. Yes. She said, uh, please kindly ask for clarification. Why did it read there a while ago, Feast of Unleavened Bread on the seventh month? Be um, so I was probably did it very poorly. I was trying to show that Jeroboam made a feast in the eighth month, right? And um, that's a counterfeit of God's true feast, which would have been um, celebrated in Jerusalem during the seventh month. Okay. That's that's tabernacles, not and that's tabernacles. Program. And I, what I did was I wrote the wrong thing there. And okay. thank you, Ethelin, for catching that because neither Ed nor I caught that. So sorry. That's okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're almost done here. Does God have a true remnant? God has a church. It is not the great cathedral. Neither is it the national establishment. Neither it is the various denominations. It is the people who love God and keep his commandments. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Where Christ is, even among the humble few, this is Christ's church for the presence of the high and holy one who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute a church. Where two or three are present who love and obey the commandments of God, Jesus there presides. Let it be in the desolate place of the earth, in the wilderness, in the city, or enclosed in prison walls. The glory of God has penetrated the prison walls, flooding with glorious beams of heavenly light, the darkest dungeon. His saints may suffer, but their sufferings will, like the apostles of old, 
spread their faith and win souls to Christ and glorify his holy name. The bitterest opposition expressed by those who hate God's great moral standard of righteousness should not and will not shake the steadfast soul who fully trusts fully in God. And finally, um, Revelation says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So God does have a remnant. And let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are so many lessons in this story for us. There's not only prophetic types for the last days, but also um, personal lessons for us. May we honor you and obey you through your word always, Lord. May we be part of that remnant. We thank you also, Lord, for the word made flesh and for your spirit that dwells among us. And we pray all these things in the name of your only begotten son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you mm. very much. That was good. And thank you, Ethelyn, for finding that. That was terrible, Piper. Um, Linda, can I now ask, can you maybe send me a copy of your PowerPoint? Because I would love to go look a bit further around the references you have. That was very interesting. I found that extremely okay. interesting. I Please, will. I would love but I will, to have that one. I will change, believe me, I will change that <laughs> error. That I was about to check up on you. We, we got some sharp people, the M&M and &M and, and ESE. Yeah. They are very sharp, I tell you. Yes. Uh, oh, you but know, I'd just like to look at that whole study. That's, that's actually okay. very interesting. The Seventh Day Adventist Church will say, "Well, we don't put a golden calf in our church." Uh. <laughs> but if you go back to the original, you had the Most Holy Place where the doctrines, the Ten Commandments, was in the Most Holy. So we have put that Trinity in with the other doctrines yeah. and put it as the basis of our church, and that is the same thing that you talked about today. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but Linda, back at the beginning, you said something that may uh, about, uh, in other words, he served the Lord, but only for a while. It made me think of when something really goes, you know, really major in our life or our country, like when 9-11 happened here. Everybody, oh, they started praying and seeking God, but not really from the heart. It was just something to get them through what they were going through. Mm. And then God was left behind again. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Happens a lot now. <laughs> yes. Isn't it amazing how David's children and grandchildren had all the advantages in the world and they just blew it for the most part. Still it happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, before it's, it's I just... before I go on and start back for Christian, I just wanted to let everybody listening know you probably got the email that we will finish Christians and then be back in about an hour at um, one, our time for Brent. Next week, it should be working on his on his place, but right now it's uh, not so. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, we'll be back an hour after we're done with uh, Christians. I'm working slowly through Brent's stuff. He's just like pause and watch, pause and watch. <laughs> And I'm still in like on the second, that one I really have to look because <laughs> I'm, I'm a banker. I'm not a, a mathematician and I had to go and sit and work those things out. And, you know, bankers only have 10 fingers and 10 toes because there's only 10 notes in a packet. So we only need to count to 10. Mm -hmm. The rest of it, uh-uh. Accountancy is my strong point, not math. <laughs>